And there we go. So last time we were talking about discrete time signals and um, what they look like, what flavors they come in. We started talking about some of the things that can happen uh, in the process of turning continuous time signals into discrete time signals, a process called sampling. And so today what we're going to do is talk about that process in a whole lot more detail and look at what happens to continuous time signals when we sample them. What are the implications of that? And how do we model that? How do we see if we can infer from some, some mathematical model of this sampling process and draw from that some conclusions about how do you sample in a way that we get all the important information out of a signal as we saw last time, if you do it wrong, it seems like, well, one of the things that you could do is mess up, for example, what frequency we're hearing in that signal. And so today we want to attack how do we prevent that kind of thing from happening, this thing we call aliasing. And so it's going to take us a whole period just to get to the basic model and what it's basically saying, but we're going to arrive at the fundamental sampling theorem and see where it comes from so that we know not just what we have to do, but why, why is it that that's the law that holds. So we start again with uh, the idea that we're probably talking about some continuous time signal that we'll use like a XC of T as our continuous time signal, and converting it before we do any fancy processing, <coughs> we're just trying to get it converted into a discrete time signal that we can use digital, su uh, digital signal processing <coughs> techniques on. And most of the course, we'll talk about what goes on in the green box, how we design or analyze discrete time systems. But again, if we're working with real world signals, first we've got to solve this problem. How do I get the signal out of the real world into the discrete domain so that I can operate on it and do something cool? And then, well, I'm going to probably have to get it back out. So we have these beginning and ending processes, analog to digital or digital to analog conversion that we have to talk about. And it's going to, over the next week or so, we're going to look at what's going on in those boxes, not the middle one, but starting at the first principles, how do you get a good signal in? How do you get back a good signal back out to and from the real world without messing it up in a way that's going to affect what you want to do with it inside here? OK, well, we know if we sample a continuous time signal, the discrete time version is one that's only defined at certain instances of time, what we call the sampling interval. And we're going to make the assumption that what we're talking about here is uniform sampling, which means I'm sampling this original signal at uniform time intervals, unchanging time intervals. It's always the same. Some clock is keeping me locked in that it's now, and now, and now, and now. And the time between is never different. If I start changing that, then my model doesn't work too well. Yeah? Is there any um, example or possibility that you'd ever want to sample at a non-uniform? Are there cases where you might want to sample at non-uniform? There are cases, I mean, it, it <coughs> is done in rare instances, um, usually related to um, if the nature of your signal is changing over time and you happen to know that, then, then based on some of the same criteria we'll come up with, you don't need to sample quite so often in an energy constraint system or you know, spacecraft or things like that, you might want to be manipulating those kind of things. Okay. So again, we're X of n's are discrete time signal, X C of t's are continuous time signal. We understand that discrete time signal, in the best case, just represents the actual value of the continuous time signal at particular instances of time. There integer multiples of the sampling rate, or the sampling period, T sub s. All right. Now, some nomenclature on names. Sometimes we use the words, particularly discrete time signals and digital signals um, interchangeably, and they're actually not exactly the same thing. Analog signals we understand. They're continuous time signals and continuous in amplitude. You know, voltages, current, temperature are by nature continuous analog signals, meaning the amplitude can be any value it wants. I can represent the amplitude with a real value. And the time axis also can be parsed to whatever degree of precision I want. Both are continuous functions. There's no discontinuities, hopefully. Um, but certainly, it's defined at all instances and has a measurable 
amplitude at all instances. Discrete time signals are halfway to digital signals. The idea is I still can <coughs> take this continuous time signal and just extract out of it samples at these sampling intervals, but the amplitude can still be any value it wants to be. So we would consider a pure discrete time signal as still being continuous in amplitude. It's allowed to have any value it wants for amplitude, but it's only defined at certain instances of time. So I call them discrete time signals. Like if I was taking <coughs> measurements of the hourly temperature at Mammoth Lakes, which I do most winters when I'm skiing, um, that could be a discrete time signal. It's only defined every hour when I take the measurement. I don't know what goes on in between, and I might measure it to 18 digits precision, depending on the amount of package, but I get the idea. A digital signal is one more level of, of discreting, if you will. Digital signals are, by nature, sample signals, or discrete time signals. But usually, if we're storing a signal of value in a computer, we have to use some finite precision. We have some limited number of bits we're allowed to use to represent our numbers in a computer. So whether it's in a fixed point or floating point or an integer representation, there's a finite number, finite precision, finite number of bits that we have to work with. And so by its nature, there's not just discrete time intervals now, but there's also discrete allowed levels that I can <coughs> but I can't get anything in between. And so those signals are discrete in time, and we would say they're quantized in amplitude. That's just a fancy word for discrete in amplitude as well. Right? So for example, you know, daily attendance of this class. We don't have half people coming and going. So that is a, that is a, a, a value that's easily turned into a digital kinds of measurement, digital signal. So quantized both in time and in amplitude. Now, why I make that distinction is, again, we often use the words interchangeably when we say discrete time signals we're processing, we're thinking we're doing digital signal processing, and yes, that's probably true. But here in this, this process we're gonna take on today, this sampling, it turns out <clears throat> I can model sampling, taking the guess from here to there, using some pretty straightforward linear models and understand it with those linear models. This step, this, this quantization thing doesn't work so easily. That's a process that's more model, better modeled using nonlinear models or statistical models. And uh, we don't want to get into that. So although we're talking about effects when we sample that affect both pure discrete time signals and digital signals, we're not going to bite off so much the additional problem that happens when you kind of quantize. Uh, you want to do that, take 419, take 515, take the more advanced courses, we'll get you into that. Um, but it's enough to, the, the major issue with, with the sampling process turns out to be the one that's the more constraining of our digital system. So we're going to focus on, on this step. Okay. Just to um, parse this out, when we talk about, I'm going to do an analog and digital conversion, that's really a three-step process, if you break it up, the operations individually. We have to do this time sampling, which is the process we're going to focus on today, taking a continuous time signal and making a discrete time version. If it's a truly digital signal, we'll be actually quantizing it as well. And then there's some kind of coding we have to do. We're going to turn that value, that, that quantized level, that sequence of quantized levels into binary numbers, binary representations. So there's a coding process that goes on too in order to turn, to truly do an analog to digital conversion for digital circuit or computer. So this one really has no, no time or frequency kind of effect. This one has more of a statistical <coughs> effect, but this is the one, the sampling process is the one that actually imposes the most the most potential problems for us. And so that's one we're gonna try to model really well today and talk about in some detail. All right. Before we leave it though, what does that quantization process look like? Well, from an input-output triangle transfer function, again, it looks like a staircase function. You pick out an A to D converter to D 
digitize a signal from a sensor or something, well, we, we get a, we choose a AV converter with some number of bits. Right? Let's say it's an 8-bit converter. That means I get 2 to the 8 or 256 different numbers that can come out, which means whatever my full scale range of input signal is that my AV converter can handle, 0 to 5 volts, plus or minus 5 volts, whatever the allowed input range is, that gets parsed into that, num that number of levels. And so from that, you can think of a voltage resolution, how many volts per bit or volts per count do I get? The more, the more bits, the more steps I get. The more steps I get, the narrower the range <coughs> of input signals that get the same output value. But within, within each bit, there's some finite range of input signals that produces the same output level. And so whether I get to have this much voltage or that much, I still gonna get the same answer. So I'm losing some information. There's no question about it. I'm rounding things off. I'm not, I'm not carrying with me all, all of the good stuff that I went in there with. And that's, so I can't ignore that. So for example, now here's a uh, discrete time signal that has, has continuous amplitudes coming in <coughs> as I go through that quantization process where there's only certain allowed values, well, it's going to, some of those samples that maybe had small subtle changes before are suddenly not going to have so much change. I'm going to lose a little bit. Now, I'll jump into the punchline. The way we model that is not with linear systems. That error for us, if you were to listen to that, you would, you would perceive it as a noise. The, the sample's a little bit wrong. And how much it's wrong is fairly random. And so you, if you were to listen to a music, to music that's not quantized to enough bits, you hear background noise. Just random, random plugs going through. That's, that's a quantization effect. Now that's not something we're gonna worry about in our sampling model, but just be aware that for high, high performance systems, high fidelity audio, things like that, that becomes an issue. I showed you this <coughs> first day to kind of to show you the two pieces of the process, but now maybe you can understand it in a little more detail what's going on here. If this is our time varying continuous time signal, and I'm gonna turn it into a digital signal. Well, first I can tell you what the sampling interval is. Let's say we choose 300 microseconds as, as a sampling interval. So I'm gonna get one answer for each of these vertical grid lines. And let's say we quantize this, this is our dynamic range and I'm allowed to have I have a three bit, three bit A to D converter. So I get eight levels, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, no, zero, seven, sorry, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then at any particular instance of time, effectively a perfect sampler with the perfect A to D converter would, would round up the blue line to the closest vertical level that appears at the time instant that we're sampling, and we would come up with these bunch of uh, sample values at just at those particular sampling intervals. We know nothing about what goes on in between, and some of these samples, these aren't too bad, but some of these are getting rounded up a bit, rounded up or down a little bit, introducing a small quantization error. So what you're left with then is, well, a sequence of numbers. So what comes out of the ADD converter? Well, this sample is encoded with some binary code, a different code for each level. And so the signal coming out of this would be, well, it's 0, 0, 0, and then this level 0, 1, 0, and then this level 1, 0, 1. We just get a sequence of code words coming out. And that's, those are our A to D samples. Now normally you'd have more than three bits, but you'd have probably eight bits or 16 bits or something that relates more to a byte or, or a word, code word. But you get the idea. So we've got both processes again, sampling that's in time quantization and amplitude quantization that's introducing some noise here. All right. <clears throat> if we wanted to include that quantization stuff, well, it gets really complicated. That's a nonlinear statistical kind of thing. And so pretty much every textbook, at least the first to take its sampling theory, ignores that fact. Is, well, we're going to talk about discrete time signals, and we're going to assume we have continuous amplitude. That gives us a good enough approximation of the digital case. 
And in those extreme cases, if you're doing hi-fi audio or whatever, well then we'll pull out the more complicated models. But for most applications, we have enough resolution in our EV converters that this isn't, isn't going to be a condition. Um, <clears throat> but you should keep in mind, though, for all practical digital signal processing systems carried out in computers, there is that additional quantization step that goes on. By the way, why, why wouldn't I just quantize with 32 bits? <coughs> Everything have perfect precision. Why not? Too much data. Too much? Too much data. Too much data. Yeah, you can have those samples. You want to transmit those. You want to store them on a disk. Too much data. And how much would a 32-bit AV converter running in a megahertz cost? Too much money. <laughs> right? so, so part of the job of engineering and digital signal processing systems is getting enough, enough quantization of them and using enough resolution to do the job without too much so that you keep it inexpensive and don't eat up bandwidth on the airwaves or the internet, wherever you're transmitting it. Yeah. Uh, for music, like say you quantize too much mm -hmm. and you like don't use enough bits, would it have an effect of like something like auto tune, where it like kind of rounds the sound to a certain note or something? Would would quantizing like too much? Um, turns out it wouldn't. And to Monday we'll hear an exist. No, I guess we won't. Unless you dis degrade the signal to noise ratio so horrendously that it's hard to pick out the fundamental, but you would, your ears would pick it up way before that, and you would never, never run that kind of a system. Okay. So, um, so it wouldn't, shouldn't be so bad that you couldn't pick out the the fundamental frequency. Um, and even as even the the problem we're trying to to avoid your aliasing <coughs> at any reasonable sampling rate wouldn't be so severe that it would throw off the fundamental frequency of things. And we'll, we'll see next week why that is. Good question, though. Um, OK. So <clears throat> our big question for today, um, what is the effect of sampling a continuous time signal on how that signal looks in the time domain and maybe more importantly in the frequency domain? And we're talking frequency domain, we're talking four-day spectra. If I take a signal and sample it, what happens to its Fourier spectrum? That's what we want to know. And from that, we'd like to figure out how can we perform sampling and the flip side of it, getting back into the real world that we call signal reconstruction without losing any, oops, drop a note there, without losing any important information. Okay. Or anything that we think is important information or important characteristics of the signal. Now, think about signals, what kind of characteristics are important. Well, uh, how big is the signal? Right? Its amplitude, you want to preserve that. The basic shape of it, if it's oscillating, what that frequency is. If it's got some phase angle, we don't want to mess into that. If it's a DC offset, probably we may or, depending on the system, we may or may not want to keep that. Um, usually we do. Uh, it's got exponential decays, we don't want to change in time constant. So we want to, the physical properties, the physical um, nature of the shape of the signal. We want to we want to hold on to that. Now, the question is how. Um, first of all, we have to deal with the fact that sampling is, in the general case, not a reversal process. And we hinted at this last time. But here's a bunch of samples, and these happen to be samples that we're taking that. that at uh, a sufficient time, according to the theorem that we're going to come up with, say, okay, that's good enough. However, once I take those samples, if you just give me those sample values, there's actually an infinite number of possible waveforms to have those samples. That one does, so does that one, so does that one, and I could draw any number of, of shapes in between those that would have the same samples at those instances. So there always is something lost. There always is there there always is some ambiguity. Now if I can get the right relationship between my samples and my original waveform, I won't have that problem. 
then the signal that I can recover back out of my system will actually be the original signal and can only be the original signal. Those are the rules we want to come up with today. But you see the problem. Once I have those samples, I, I, I don't know if I lost any information and I can't get it back. That's a very fundamental problem. What all these are Lose. Lose. But I know information. We can't get it back. And so there are circumstances, though, where we can take samples and can reconstruct the signal and get back what we started with. And that's what we want to do today. Before we can do that, we need a model that, well, what our goal is, is again, take the phase three signal processing out, replace it with a piece of wire, and I want to know how do I do this process, this A to B conversion, and this D to A conversion, <coughs> so that if I don't do any manipulation in between, what comes out is what goes in, without a change, at least not any change in any way that matters to me. Okay. To figure out how to do that, we need a model for this sampling and this reconstruction process. We'll start over here with the sampling process. So we'll develop a model for that process and then use that to answer those basic questions that we said, like what is the effect of the sampling process on our signals and how do we, how do, we do that in a way that we don't lose any information. <laughs> Can't loosen me either. All right. Before we do that, though, it's been a little while since we all had 228, so we got to remember a few things. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Light. I have a band limited signal. That signal has a frequency spectrum. Let's call it its magnitude spectrum. If I have a bandwidth signal x of t, I want to know what can you tell me about its frequency spectrum? Its Fourier frequency spectrum. Uh, what does that band limited name infer? So there's a certain range of frequencies that it exists. So, so let's, let's put a B there and a minus B there. And <coughs> in between here, it's doing its thing. It's got its spectrum. But what I can say for sure is outside of that range, its magnitude response is zero. That's a band limited signal. I don't know, maybe it's got some interesting shape going on here. It's going to be symmetrical. And the shape of this and its phase characteristic gives me the unique signal that I have in the time domain. But a band limit signal, I can define some frequency B that it has no content above that. All right, that's good. I like that one. What about <clears throat> if I have not a signal now, but I have a, I have a, a block? <laughs> and Maybe we're putting some signals into that. X of T, and that signal has some frequency content X of F. And this block has, it has an impulse response H of T, which gives it a frequency response H of F. And what comes out is a Y of T, and which has a spectrum of Y of F. <coughs> if this little block has a frequency response that looks kind of like that. Frequency, I don't know, let's... What kind of filter is that? Low pass, high pass, man pass, band stop? Low pass. Anybody think it's hot band pass? Those are the usual two answers are band pass and low pass. It is a low pass filter. Remember, frequency spectra 
This is two-sided. This yeah. is just the negative frequency zone. So here's DC. This is low frequencies. This is high frequencies. I'm multiplying low frequencies by some number, two in this case, and I'm multiplying high frequencies by zero. So I'm filtering, I'm removing high frequencies, I'm passing low frequencies, the low pass filter. It's, it's opposite to be a high pass filter. Frequencies are multiplied by zero. High frequencies are multiplied by, I should make it symmetric, by something, one, two, three, whatever. Yeah. What range of frequencies are considered high frequencies and what are considered low frequencies? Depends. It depends. There's no hard and fast rule. Depends on the application. Yeah. 10 kilohertz is high frequency for audio. It's bloody slow for RF work. <laughs> It's all in where you are. Okay. And bandpass, the other favorite flavor, this would be ideal. Yeah. Let's make it flatter. Let's give that up. I don't know, three. <laughs> it's a bandpass filter. Low frequencies are thrown away, high frequencies are thrown away, and only a certain range of frequencies are from, let's say, some F low to some F high are allowed through, and that would be the bandwidth, that range of frequencies. Same thing as <coughs> F low minus F high. That would be a bandpass filter. I'm only, only allowing an intermediate range of frequencies through I'm stopping the highs, I'm stopping the lows. Okay. <clears throat> so what if I take this signal and run it into, I don't know, let's make this peak value something, let's call it C. And I run it through my, I don't know, my low pass filter there. And let's say Mr. Low Pass filter is easy. Let's say A is over here. Okay, again, remember, this is a signal spectrum. This is a frequency response. But I put this signal into this system, and I want to know what comes out. What's the magnitude spectrum of the output signal look like? If I put this signal in this filter. Well, what's the height there? Get it to. Anybody care to take a crack at that? Um, it'll limit the frequency from negative a to a. It'll limit? It it'll limit that from minus a to plus a. When you say limit, it, it's just kind of like. I'm going to cut it off to zero here. Okay. So I'm going to get whatever I have between that. Draw it symmetrically. <laughs> Draw it symmetrical. And this height that was C is now 2C. Can we agree with that? <coughs> yeah, so the, magic, the magic of transforms. Why we like to look at filters and things in the frequency domain is because why of that the output is just the frequency content of the input multiplied by the frequency response of the system, which means these are all complex functions. They all have a magnitude and phase. So when we multiply complex quantities, it means we multiply their, their um, magnitudes and their phase angles. When we 
do with those. Take the angle of x, take the angle of h. And what do we do with these angles? We add them and we multiply. So if you've drawn spectra, you can do that kind of multiplication by site where you can add the phases to get the output. All right. <clears throat> Very good. One last little review, two last little review questions. So, if I, my x of t here is a sinusoidal signal, and I put it into a system that I tell you is linear and time invariant, LTI. Sinusoid goes in, sinusoid comes out, right? Is that sinusoid coming out allowed to be different in amplitude than the one that went in? Yes. Absolutely. Is it allowed to be different in phase? Yes. Absolutely. Is it allowed to be different in frequency? No. No, 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 no. Can't do that. I can change the amplitude. I can shift in time. I can't change its frequency. That's a nonlinear operation. And we're talking about linear time invariant systems. Okay. Last review. <clears throat> I have, <coughs> I have a, I have a signal. <laughs> no, let's do that. Let's do a nice, easy. I have a signal, and let's call this even a time signal. Let's call this x of t. X of t. <laughs> And I don't know, let's call this, um, let's not be confusing. I'm going to call this mm, mm, I of t. And that I of t happens to be an impulse at time t equals zero <coughs> with a weight of five. And x here goes from, I don't know, two to four. If I multiply those two, what's the product of these two? What's the product of those two? Hmm? Ten? Is that all I get is ten? I get a number? <laughs> This times this gives me what signal? Which an impulse? I get an impulse. This guy's infinitely high. I'm not losing him, but his weight got multiplied. I scaled this by the value of that function. That was the multiplication property of impulses. All right, <clears throat> that was too easy. What if I do this? What if I convolve them? What do I get? Remember what I get when I convolve something? An impulse? You get the same thing with the um, amplitudes five times higher. Ten. Twenty. I get the same thing, except it gets scaled by the weight of the impulse. And if my impulse was, if my impulse was over here, at, I don't know, 10, did it also shift? I get this guy moved over to 10 and copied and dropped in there and scaled. That's the convolution property of impulses. We're going to need those, and we're going to race to the finish line here. Are everybody OK with those? They're kind of, kind of coming back, kind of remember? All right. Let's use those in our model. Let's see if we can explain sampling using these kind of arguments. All right. So here's how we're going to do for sampling. Here's my continuous time signal coming in. I'm going to sample it. Out comes my x of n. Well, 
we're going to mathematically break it up into two stages. First, the sampling stage, which we're going to model as an impulse modulator. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually another step. We'll return that continuous tying signal that comes out of this process and turn it into a number. Well, um, we'll put that in a box, say that it has, we're just, we're just converting, extracting numbers from it. It doesn't really have any frequency effect. Everything that we need to know is happening in that first process. So if I can model a signal coming in, and I'm going to model the sampling process, this is kind of weird, but this does work. I'm going to model sampling as taking that signal and multiplying it by a, what we call an impulse train. An impulse train means a continuous time signal. A continuous time impulse is a whole bunch of them, an infinite number of them, in fact, where they're spaced in time by the sampling interval T sub s. And so what happens when I multiply this guy by that, the answer comes out to be a bunch of impulses, again. Their weights pick up the value of the function, but it also helps because it, there's nothing to find in between these. So it gives me the, the continuous time kind of characteristics or the continuous time model of the sampled signal. It's a little bit contrived, but it actually works pretty well. So I'm going to multiply this signal by this weird impulse train. And what comes out, I'll pick off the, the weights of each of these impulses as my sample values and turn those into numbers for my discrete time signal. That's how we're going to do this. Um, assuming there's no quantization going on in that conversion, it's perfect. But here's what we're going to do. And we're, so look at what happens to these signals when we <coughs> do this process, both in the time domain and the frequency domain. And out from that, we'll pop the requirements of perfect sampling. So here's that, here's that impulse train. Well, one impulse is a delta of t, right? A shift of delta is delta of t minus t sub s. And an infinite number of them with the same spacing is just a sum of them over every possible integer multiple of t sub s. So this is a shorthand notation for that string of impulses that are spaced by multiples of the sampling interval. We have the nomenclature similar to what we've been using for discrete time signals. But this, is a, this is a continuous time impulse train. It's an impulse that happens every t sub s, two t sub s, three t sub s, and each one has a weight of one. So far so good, still with me? All right. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take that x of t, I'm gonna multiply it by that bunch of impulses, and out's gonna pop, well that's doing this mathematically, and what does come out? Well. If I multiply x of t, a continuous function, by one of these impulses, well, that impulse grabs one value and scales the impulse, right? So does this one, so does this one, so does this one. That's that product property of impulses. So I can bring that x of t into the summation and evaluate x of t at the time that the impulse fires, n t sub s, and have an equivalent expression. And, well, this is, this weight value is, in fact, the x of n I'm looking for. It's x of t at particular n t sub s's. That's what I'm trying to get to. But what is that in our model? It's a bunch of impulses <coughs> whose weights are the values of this function at the time that each of those impulses fires. That's what my signal coming out here looks like, supposedly. So this is the signal here, here's the signal there. What comes out is this bunch of impulses. All right. <clears throat> now, I want to look at what goes on in the frequency domain. I want to do, look at all those operations. I want to look at this incoming signal's frequency spectrum. I want to look at this signal's frequency spectrum. I want to see what happens when I multiply those two and deal with their spectra properly so that I can see what's the frequency spectrum of this signal coming out. That's what we want to do. I'm not, this time domain model not telling me much. I want to see what's going on there in the frequency level. And we get there by Fourier transforms, right? All right. So I got to take the Fourier transform of the input signal. I got to take the Fourier transform of this impulse train. 
I've got to figure out what happens to Fourier transforms when I multiply things in the time domain so that I can predict what is the Fourier transform, what is the spectrum of the sample C. That's where I'm going. Okay. We're going to assume that signal coming in is band limited. That's why we review that. Right? <clears throat> so there's some maximum frequency, call it B, that we know this input signal has zero frequency content above that. So we'll start with a band limited signal. That's the spectrum of my input signal. Done. Right now I'm not going to worry about what goes on in here. Any shape it wants to be, but it's band limited. That's one signal. This one's a pain. It was hard enough for us to wrap our mind around this description of this impulse train, let alone what it really is. You can't make one of those in the real world. But, and now I'm going to ask you, what's the Fourier transform of that? And you're going to look back at me with incredulous stares, like you really expect me to know that? Which is why most textbooks will tell you the Fourier transform of that is an impulse train in the frequency domain. Ta-da! I'll prove it to you in three minutes or less. But that's where we're going. It turns out the Fourier transform of this is a bunch of impulses in the frequency domain. How can we prove that? Oh, oh more review. Oh, man. Hopefully you would recognize this is a Fourier series. This is a Fourier series reconstruction summation. If I give you the exponential Fourier series coefficients for a periodic signal, I would plug it into this formula to get back to time signal. Right? Is this a periodic signal? Absolutely. The period is T sub S. Okay. <clears throat> now, I'm going to bring use that to derive the Fourier transform of this periodic signal by getting to its Fourier series and then looking how the Fourier transforms are related to Fourier series. Remember, the Fourier transform of a constant is a delta. That was a Fourier transform theorem. Another Fourier transform theorem, if I multiply something by e to the j anything in the time domain, what I do to the frequency domain is shift its frequency position. So if I multiply one times that, I shift the delta by this amount of frequency. Frequency shift theorem for Fourier transforms. If I multiply any time domain function by a constant, even a complex one, I multiply its Fourier transform by the same constant. That's linearity. So if I know the Fourier transform of this exponential is a shift to delta, if I multiply that exponential by a even a, even a complex constant, I'm just going to multiply this by the same complex constant. And that's looking like that. I can make this look like this by just making a sum, a linear sum of all these guys. And linearity says if I sum stuff here, I sum <coughs> stuff here. And so give me a Fourier series its Fourier transform is a bunch of shifted delta functions weighted by the Fourier series coefficients of the original waveform. And located only at integer multiples of whatever the fundamental frequency was of your Fourier series. Wow. All right. So which means if I want to know what the Fourier transform of this, I need to know the Fourier series coefficients of that. Mm -hmm. Only out of time. So we would plug that into the Fourier series coefficient, the other Fourier series one. The way we get the Fourier series coefficients, the exponential ones, from the time domain function. Well, it's, a, it's an integral over one period of the time function e to the minus j2 pi k f t dt, with a 1 over t sub s out in front. In our case, I'm going to take one period of our pulse train, which is just one impulse, plug it in here, I got impulse times the rest of the stuff. <sighs> Product property of impulses says if this guy fires at t equals zero, I put t equals zero in here and I get e to the j is zero, which is just one. So now I have an integral of an impulse through the impulse, which gives me one the area of the impulse. So this whole nastiness degenerates to one 
and put it out in front, one over T sub S. <coughs> is the Fourier series coefficients of this guy. Plug that back in the formula we came up with the other side. And lo and behold, the Fourier transform of this impulse train is an impulse train weighted by 1 over T sub S, not in time anymore, but in frequency. A bunch of impulses spaced by the reciprocal of the time, sampling time, the sampling rate, X sub S whose weights are 1 over T sub S. And if you didn't buy that, OK, just read the book. The book says, or a transform of this is that. Okay. We could prove it with MATLAB, but I'm not going to take the time. <clears throat> let's get to the punchline. Oh, OK, let's back up first. Let's not do this. until we see the top. OK, I have a spectrum for that. I have a spectrum for this. When I multiply things in the time domain, what do we do to them in the frequency domain? Convolution. Um, that means I have to convolve the spectrum of this with the spectrum of that. Okay. Well, that's why we reviewed that. Guess what? We got a bunch of impulses. They're easy to convolve. Go, 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 Repeated every place is a delta function. That gives me x of f minus k f s. All of them, sum over k, weighted by 1 over t sub s. Right? So that's this picture. Right? We take this guy, replicate it everywhere there's a delta function, scale its height, not a anymore, but a over t sub s now. We get those scaled copies. Ooh, 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 ooh. Wait a minute. If I sample a signal, when I sample music, I don't hear this. I don't hear all that. Why not? Oh, there's that thing at the other end, the D-day converter and reconstruction. If I want to get back the signal I started with, I got to throw these copies away. How do we do that? <coughs> Well, we take our signal, <coughs> sample it, and we throw away the extra copies with a low-pass filter. But if I don't want to lose anything in the process, because I have all these copies, I want to make sure these copies don't overlap. Because if they start overlapping, then the stuff going on at the bottom of this one starts messing with the stuff at the top here, and I can't tell one from the other. They'll be intermixing. So let me blow up what's going on in here. I've got a band limit signal that ends at B. This next copy of it centered on FS has a lower, a negative spectrum that goes to FS minus B. And so I don't want these to touch. That means I need this point, FS minus B, to be higher than this point, B. For rearranging, I need FS to be greater than 2B that's the Nyquist criterion. That's how you do sampling so that you don't get aliasing, so that you get back what you started with. And that's why if we are sampling at some sampling rate fs, we call fs over 2 the Nyquist rate, or the Nyquist frequency. Meaning your signal that you're sampling better not have any frequency content above that or you lose your aliasing. You're going to mess it up. That's where the criterion comes from. Sampling has the implication that it makes periodically repeating copies of your spectrum. You have to keep those spectrums separated so that you can, so that they're not intermixing and overlapping, so that you can do this. On that output side, put in a low pass filter that's zero everywhere except where one of these copies is, one of these uncorrupted copies so that what comes out has the original shape. That's how we do the D to A process. 
That's the punchline. That's the Nyquist criterion. That's how we do sampling. When we come back on Monday, we'll look in a little more detail about how that works, how to make it work well, what happens when you don't, how do you predict where things are moving when they start moving around. So have a good weekend. <laughs>